You're listening to Secrets of a Bridal Seamstress podcast. I'm your host, Nadine Bozeman. In this podcast, I'm sharing business systems and strategies specifically tailored to the bridal sewing industry so you can build your own modern and profitable bridal alterations business. Join me as I also get to chat with fellow seamstresses and share their personal success stories. I'm so glad you're here and that we can grow together in this unique trade. Hey friends, before we get into another episode, I want to share with you about a free private podcast series that we have available for you all about the subject of branded fitting packages. So if you have ever considered charging for fittings or maybe adding a little bit of additional passive income to your average ticket, this would be a great free podcast series for you to explore. It also includes testimonials of bridal seamstresses who have added branded fitting packages to their own portfolio, and they share about their additional income that they've seen in the years since adding fitting packages. And we're talking about like $15,000 to $20,000 in revenue. So it's a big chunk of change. And I can confidently say that every bridal seamstress that has added branded fitting packages to their portfolio has seen this kind of exponential growth and benefit to their business. So I encourage you to sign up for that free podcast series, and it will hit your inbox as soon as you sign up. And you'll have have all the tools that you need to create your own fitting packages and also put together a beautiful investment guide to share these services with your potential clients. So that link is in the show notes if you're interested in tuning in. And I'm really excited to learn what this could do for your business this year. Welcome back to another episode of Secrets of Bridal Seamstress. I'm so excited to have Peggy Mead with us today. She is the creator and designer behind Sew House 7 Patterns. So I'm, I'm like fangirling because if you're unfamiliar with Sew House 7, it's an indie pattern company. It's based in Portland, Oregon. And as a Washington girl, obviously I'm a fan, but I love your instructions. I love your designs. We can talk about my favorites. So I've, I've been a fan for a while. So I'm, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So thank you for being with us. Hopefully Peggy is going to ignite our inspiration for creativity and inspire us to keep going in our businesses. You know that like creative owning a creative business comes with its own set of challenges. So I'm really excited to hear your take on this. So let's hear about how you started to sew. I love this part because I like to know who taught you to sew. What was your first project? You know, take us way back. Okay. Well, (laughs) going way back. So when I was little, like in kindergarten, my best friend at the time, her mom taught pattern making and, and, sewing and things at the University of Idaho, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I was at her house all the time. And she had like a big loom in the living room. And my friend, Anne, I think got her first sewing machine when she was seven or something, maybe even earlier. I don't know, but they were always, you know, so I was kind of inspired by them. But I remember our first project was Anne and I were in the, the kindergarten class together. And one day when we were at my house, my mom sewed a little, but not a ton, but she had like a big scrap bag of fabric and Ann and I decided that we were going to make outfits for each other even though we'd never sewn before and we pulled out this lime green cotton fabric I remember it was kind of gauzy and we just cut and then we would have my mom tell my mom where to sew the sides and then we made hand embroidered like dogs on the front I made one for her and she made one for me and then we even made sandals out of like cardboard the bottom and then taped fabric scraps to them and our moms let us wear them to school like they were sleeveless we didn't set in sleeves or anything they were just like raw edge and, but you know some dog like a five-year-old would draw that the is, oh, on. and so then my mom had to bring real shoes because my shoes fell apart at oh, school at the playground our <laughs> shoes will do that to you <laughs> but then around seven or eight I convinced my mom to teach me how to sew like so so and we went because you couldn't depend on other people to like make your designs you had to start doing it yourself right (laughs) (laughs) but I remember we laid down and like just kind of traced and then just you know drew a dress (laughs) that is the cutest story I think that may win the best first sewing experiment (laughs) story because we hear like all of them on this show you know (laughs) (laughs) I was totally into sewing for a long time oh what is and and well, yeah, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Anne's mom, yeah, for starting you, Anne. this whole thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, what was the first thing? Do you remember a first thing that you made that you were like, "Well, it sounds like you were pretty proud of the lime green dog outfit," but something that you made like later on that you're thinking, "Wow, this is good. Like, I can do this." 
Was it like a confidence outfit? You know, I don't remember the exact outfit, but I just, I just remember sewing most of my clothes, except for the jeans, because, mm -hmm. you know, growing up, it was like, you had to have the whatever brand name jeans. Yep. There were certain things that you had to yeah. have, but right. you couldn't mess with that. Some of the basics. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but you know, when I was littler, it was more like just sewing, you know, my mom kind of helped me in sewing a a simplicity top. I don't even remember. The, I, well, I think the very first thing I did kind of had like a, a tie in the back and like looser sleeves, kind of a smocky top. I don't mm -hmm. remember exactly. And then after that, I think my mom kind of let me go. I would just like read the instructions and figure them out, you know, but mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact outfits, but I did, you know, in junior high, make most of my clothes. Mm -hmm. And then in high school, I didn't make all of my clothes, but I made like anytime there were formal events, I made just about all my friends' dresses and I never charged anybody. It was just like an excuse to, to sew them. You know, I, wow. I just wanted to sew, especially fancy things. And so everybody just buy their fabric and bring it over and I'd just start sewing. And oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> wow, at high school, that's like a lot of pressure yeah. for a high schooler. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I loved it. You know, but I grew up in a small town. There wasn't a ton of stuff to do. And that was my thing. I just wanted to sew. And yeah. So I took oh, over my I mom's machine. You know, I just took over her sewing room and her machine. When so. I was in high school, I was really into quilting. And so like high schoolers weren't quilters. I, maybe it was even like middle school. And my mom had a friend who quilted. And so I went to her house and she showed me how to do the things. And like before that, I took a sewing class and I was the only kid who was like pumped about the projects and like finished them early, you know? So it's just funny, like even now when I'm quilting, it just brings me right back because I don't, I had a phase in my life where I was like quilting for money, like to make little commission oh. custom quilts, but now it's like just my little fun space. And yeah. so when I come back to that, it just takes me back to like, oh, the fun creative, you know, yeah. just being yeah. in a little fun zone, whatever. Yeah. So did you know, like in high school that you wanted to pursue a career in this creative space? Because there's a difference between like having it be your outlet and then having it be like your moneymaker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yes and no. Like, I think when I was maybe before high school, like I would daydream, I would look, get like the old McCall's simplicity pattern books and Vogue and stuff and look through them and imagine like how I would make things different or how, what I would design, you know, put in there. And I just, I mean, I would love to have my own pattern company. Really? You know, back in the seventies, sixties or seventies, you know, I was thinking that not sixties, but in the seventies. And, but I didn't actually think this is what I'm going to do. I, I, by the time I was in high school, I was kind of more, I, I love to sew, but I was kind of more outdoorsy and I didn't want to live in a city. And I just, I didn't, I just associated that with like, working for Ralph Lauren or something. I didn't think you could right. work for smaller companies or I didn't realize what all else was out there. So no, I was going to go to school and be a marine biologist. And my dad kept trying to discourage me. He's like, you know, I don't think, because my dad is a scientist and, and oh, a biologist. And he kept saying, you know, you're probably going to be working in a lab. You're not going to be Jacques Cousteau, you know? And the reality of him saying that you should do something creative. You're always doing creative things, but you know, do what you want. But, you know, I see you doing something creative. And so I kind of changed my major a lot in school. And I, a lot. I did. <laughs> and I, I ended up changing to nutrition. I was going to be a dietitian. I went all the way through the program. And then as soon as I got to where I had to do the internship and take the test for the RDA, I realized this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to work in a hospital, you know, mm -hmm. and, and order the kitchen equipment. I mean, there's a lot more options for dietitians nowadays, but at that mm -hmm. time, I was like, that's what you did. Just worked in the hospital. So I, I didn't, I went back and just got a, a graphic design degree just because I'd taken a lot of art classes, but didn't want to do that. Just thought, what am I going to do now? And then thought about going, my dad said, you really should go into design. And I thought, well, okay. So I applied at FIT, but then chickened out because I really didn't want to go live in New York. I was going to say, you, you knew from when, from high school, you didn't want to live in yeah. the city and then yeah. you're going to check over to New York yeah. City. <laughs> so I ended up going back and getting a master's degree. Not like I need a master's degree, but I went to Oregon State because it's, you know, they, had, they supposedly had a good apparel design program, but they also would offer like an, a degree. So like if I decided I wanted to teach or something, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I could fall back on that. 
And, and then I wouldn't have to take like beginning sewing and beginning, you know, when you're a right. master's degree student, you can kind of pick and choose what you're going to take. So I just wanted to learn how to make patterns and drape and, and then maybe be able to teach it. And so I did that and I did teach a little bit at the art Institute. I taught draping and I realized I'm just not a good teacher. I get too nervous. You know, I love helping people with projects, but having to stand up there and like, you know, show people how to drape for four hours. I yes. just couldn't do it. Yeah. Couldn't stand it. <laughs> and I'm not good when people, you know, were making excuses for why they didn't have their projects done and stuff. I'm just not like a hard nosed, you know, mm -hmm. like I just, I'm just a pushover. And I just thought I, it's too much work. I don't want to do this. You don't yeah. get, you get paid for your in-class hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I didn't do that very long, but ended up in the industry, in the apparel industry. And I learned a lot, but I really hate the apparel industry. <laughs> You know, and it's not as creative as you think. So I never really mm -hmm. sewed all the years that I was working in the business. I didn't really sew. I kind of gave up sewing because I was so sick of looking at clothes all day and thinking about it. And I was so into my outdoor sports that when work was done, I just wanted to go climbing or backpacking or kayaking That's or something. Right. Yeah. Get out and not think about clothes. So it wasn't till 10 years ago. Well, it was actually a little bit before then. I was just so fed up with my just ready to be done out of the industry and trying and, and thought about what I, you know, going back to, you know, starting a pattern business. But at that time, I didn't really know, you know, how, what that would look like. Cause I wasn't on Instagram. Instagram was pretty new and mm -hmm. I didn't know there was a community out there. I didn't know you could sell online. I just kind of started it blindly and then thought I would just pedal the patterns out to fabric shops. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually surprised at how easy it was. People were kind of hungry for it and they, mm -hmm. you know, everybody just said yes. And I thought, well, that was easy. Cause that was the part I was worried about was like having to sell my stuff. Yes. But yeah. And I think people were so ready for, at least I know I was before I discovered like indie pattern companies, like I didn't enjoy making clothes. You know what I mean? When I think yeah. back to these unnamed, more traditional pattern designers or pattern producers it wasn't fun for me and then when these like indie creators popped up I'm like first of all I would actually wear that and then number two it came with re more like realistic pictures way easier instructions so they're just so easy to eat up and recreate you know so I can totally understand how the demand was there but before we get any further I just want to appreciate how long it took you to get here and how many decisions had to be made and changed along the way. <laughs> I think sometimes this like, there's like this misnomer that you're going to have this creative life and you're just going to step into it and it's going to be successful immediately. And when we look at people who are successful in the creative space, we just assume that it's easy to get there and that things were handed to them or that like they woke up and they decided this is what they were going to do. And everything was just going to be like laid out for them. And I, it happens over and over again, you know, sharing these kinds of stories that it takes making kind of maybe wrong decisions or figuring out, no, this isn't for me. I don't like teaching. Yeah. I don't like draping for four hours. Like yeah. I don't want to be a scientist or whatever, like yeah. all these things that you just have to experience before you figure out like, this isn't me. And then it led you to something that even just like this, like brief encounter that we've had, I'm like, I can totally see you behind every pattern like even like your outdoorsiness totally translates into your clothing you know what I'm saying so I'm like of course she's a rock climber like all these things like <laughs> that are coming out and it's like it takes those steps to get to where you are now and you you have such an authentic brand that so reflects who you are but still can translate to the public so well so for those of you listening it can happen even if you just have a lot of twists and turns along the way it's just yeah. meant to be yeah. Yeah. And I think even once you start a successful business, it, it can evolve, you know, and change mm -hmm. too. Because I think when I started, I kept thinking, I'm going to make just totally different wild things. But, you know, I, I always kind of kept with the mantra that it should be kind of simple. So people didn't get discouraged or not finish it. Cause I, mm -hmm. I would, I was so busy with my life that whenever I did find time. So, I mean, like I said, growing up, I sewed all the time. That's all I did. And I sewed everything. But then as an adult, I just didn't have time. And sometimes I'd, I'd have wild hair and I think I'm going to make this. And then I would, you know, 
lose my steam and not finish it because it mm -hmm. wasn't quick. And oh, I we can't relate to that up. at all. We don't know yeah. what unfinished product <laughs> projects feel like <laughs> as I'm like looking at my stack, like literally right there. <laughs> I know, I know that's what in it. I felt, you know, and then being kind of a more, you know, thinking about not wasting things. I just would have this guilt, you know, like I don't even mm -hmm. want to wear that anymore and it needs to be sewn up or what am I going to do with that? And mm -hmm. having to finish it just so you can donate it. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's hard. I don't like that color anymore. I would yeah. have that where like I would buy fabric and then it's like, I'd make this project and I'm like, this isn't even my color. Like why did I, and then I don't want to donate it, but I'm not going to wear it. So it just would hang in my closet. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> I mean, and it's funny because when I was, you know, in high, junior high and high school and I had had endless amounts of time, I loved the more intricate, you know, like formal dresses mm -hmm. and all the details and things that took a long time. And, you know, I, I love, I reveled in that, but now, you know, I realize most people are, even if you are an experienced sewist, people are busy, they have families and things and and obligations and unless they're making something for like a wedding or mm -hmm. special event people are usually not always you know want something kind of simple and yeah, then give me a good like, tunic any yeah, day <laughs> yeah and things have gotten more casual too like I was just in San Francisco and I brought all these nice clothes thinking I would like it'd be an opportunity to like take photos of you know stuff I made and then I realized even there at the high-end restaurants people were <laughs> wearing just their you know, basic, you know, and I thought, you know, people and not, and it's kind of takes the, it takes the pressure off of having to dress up, but then sometimes it is nice to dress up. So I just like to kind of think about more basic, simple <laughs> things that could be elevated and, and seem dressed up, but also you don't look so like too fancy for everybody else yeah. casual, you know, and a lot right. of my friends are just outdoor people that never dress up. And so when I walk into the room with some fancy dress, I just, I don't know. I just need to be more confident and, and not care and just wear it anyway. But so yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of ways to make cool, fun things that don't look too, mm -hmm. look at me. I'm trying to, you know, yeah. it's very, it's a very Pacific Northwest brand. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so my girlfriends who are seamstresses, like in the East coast, you know, like I tease and say like West coast weddings, even at their like most, even the most extravagant West coast wedding doesn't compare to an East coast wedding. It's just like two different worlds. Yeah. You know what I mean? And what we think of as like professional wear is like not the same. And yeah, it's just as funny, but that's why we live here because we love it. Yeah. So, you know, right. right. Kind of make designs that are true to you. So right. once you kind of found like, okay, oh, well, what was the first pattern that you launched? Well, I decided that I was going to do three because I thought if I go to shops and I only have one pattern, they might not buy it. Like I wanted right. to have like kind of a small collection. So I had the Mississippi Avenue dress, the Bridgetown backless dress and the Alberta street pencil skirt. And they all have really long names. And I've been trying not to name things so long because the hashtags, you know, I didn't <laughs> think about that. I was trying to do Portland names, you know, yeah. but yeah. So I had those three. And so those are older patterns that now, you know, I have layered PDF files and more expanded sizes and stuff. And I haven't really gone back and updated those three mm -hmm. because they're older, but yeah. goes Do, you have a favorite? So Do you have like a top three of your collection? Yeah, I think my favorite is probably the Burnside bibs. Like you said, <gasps> me <too>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't know if it's because that was a quarantine project for me. So I made that really? in 2020 and yeah. I bought, I got the fabric from Bolt in Portland. So I had it yeah. shipped to me. And because I think they were, well, of the people that I were, that I was following at the time, they were one of the first to offer shipped fabric. Let's keep you yeah. busy, you know. And this was probably like April, 2020 when it was like fun. You know what I mean? When we're like, yeah. oh, we're making masks and we're just staying home. Yeah, oh, we're just going to sell home. <laughs> you know. Excuse to so, <laughs> Exactly. So that was, and then like my husband like took pictures of me when they were done and I was so proud of them. I made the pants like a little bit more narrow because I'm 5'2". So like the wide legs, I was like, I think this is too wide for me. But with patterns, you can do that. Yeah. Um, and I so do that I too know. for me because I'm yeah. short as well. So I, I, <laughs> I think, I don't know if it was the experience of like, just thinking back to that time, but I wear them frequently. So, and I've worn them in a few branding shoots too. So they're favorites. So anyway, oh, so we got the same favorite. You. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 
reason I think I like that one, it, it's funny now there's so many amazing pattern designs out there. I mean, when I, back when I started, there weren't that many people mm -hmm. doing it or, or maybe there were, but it just now there's so many and so many people doing like really cool things, but it's really, it's really hard to find kind of original things. And I think the Burnside bibs, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of look similar now, but at the time that I put those out, it was like definitely my design. It wasn't like anything else. And I think that's what I strive to kind of do is something that you wouldn't be able to just go and buy somewhere. Yeah. Although I've kind of fallen into the, I thought I never would, but I've fallen into the basics. You know, I've done some basic tees and things that are not like a design original, but, but I don't know. I just think the, the Burnside bids, because that was just Mm -hmm. my total, you know, original design that still stands up that I still get a lot of orders for. Yep. Cause and I'd like to make them again, like in a linen or like a linen blend. Cause I made them in like, a, they were like true denim bits. Oh, yeah, yeah. So now I'm like, okay, I want to go back and make them like as a linen version or just like a lighter weight or like a, yeah, like a seersucker or something kind of cute. Oh, like seersucker like a spring, yeah. Like yeah. a spring version. Yeah. yeah. So share the gifts that have come from this pattern company? Like once you're finally established, like who have you been able to work with or what, what have you heard from clients that are telling you like, oh my goodness, this is where I'm meant to be. Are there unexpected blessings that came through once you settled into Soho 7? So many. Yeah. I mean, one being just being a business owner and finally like being able to do what I want to do and, and not have to answer to anybody and being proud of what I'm doing. You know, sometimes I just have to pinch myself. Like, I can't believe I'm making a living and I'm doing everything on my own. It's so fulfilling. And then the other thing is just, I think the community that I've met online and then in real life, like I never knew anybody else who sewed mm -hmm. uh, except for my friend, Anne, when I was really little, but <laughs> after that, nobody uh, it was just you know people come to me and want me to make things but nobody to like talk about sewing with or mm -hmm. share it or I don't know it just it, I, a friend of mine she actually worked for me for a while she was such a help but she does a lot of community building and planning like our frog tails events and all sorts mm -hmm. of community events she doesn't get paid she just it's a lot of work but she just loves to community build and so I met her through frog tails because she asked me to donate patterns and we've become like she's one of my best friends now and then we have a group of us that we just we keep meeting more and more people and we get together and have like we went to the beach and sewed and um you know we just that is so fun yeah she, she's organized these um bike tours where we had like 60 people last summer where we went around to different small businesses that were sewing related and we stopped here at mine and um I don't know it's just you know it's not just sewing that I have in common with these people. Like these people are truly friends who I think I would like even outside of sewing. And yeah, yeah. I can't believe I met them through my work. You know, it's just, oh, I love that. Yeah. 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 Even some of like, some of my best friends, yeah, I met on Instagram through yeah. Secrets of Bridal Seamstress. And I'm like, what? Like the internet does work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. this is what social media is supposed to do. Yeah. And like, just kind of putting yourself out there can be scary, but like, gosh, like thinking of what your life is like now, I got to yeah. chuckle when you said the bike tour, because I think, you know, if you're not from like the Pacific Northwest, specifically <laughs> Portland, you're unfamiliar with like how important bike routes and bike lanes are yeah. in like Seattle's trying to catch up with Portland, but it's a, it's a thing. So when you go to Portland, like you need to like look out for the bikes and plan your routes around the bike lane. So I could just picture you guys like tootling around to little fabric shops. <laughs> yeah. And she had it organized. She had people, I forget what they're called, who actually like stopped traffic and flagged and because there was, awesome. yeah, this, it was it was big. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was shocked how many people there were, but yeah, it's just been a great community. And then people who I haven't met in real life, but just friends on Instagram. Yeah. I, you know, complain about sometimes social media is, is a drag, but most of the time, the benefits that I've gotten through it through work have been amazing. And I've even met like long lost friends. I've had a few people contact me like, oh my gosh, I saw your website. And then I read the, and oh my gosh, you're doing this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a drink or something. I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's been yeah. 
It's been great. So cool. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, this is the studio where Peggy takes the pictures for Instagram. <laughs> so if you see the cool poses with the, you know, the cute clogs, this is the space where it all happens. So <laughs> when is the, when is the Portland Frock Tales this year? Uh, I don't think we're happy. having one this year, but okay. I think Peggy is more helping with the Seattle one. Okay. Uh, and then a lot of it, like last year, we, we, a bunch of us from Portland went up to the Seattle Frock Tales and got a room and that was so much fun. We stayed the whole weekend and we shopped the next day and did all these things. Fun. Yeah. It was very fun. So I think that she's combining those because she's been doing a lot of the planning for, it's just a lot of planning. So to yeah. do, help with that one and then do one here. Mm -hmm. But she's got, I think she's got the bike palooza thing going again. So there's a lot of little frock tails events. And we just had one. We all took a bus and went out to Mary Hill. Are you familiar with the Mary Hill Museum? No. It's out in the gorge and it's quite a ways and it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not in a town or anything. It's, so it's like a two hour drive. Yeah, and I go by it all the time. Yeah. So when I was in, in design school, my, one of my professors had a book about this collection, mini collection that they like Christian Dior. And if you watch the new look on Apple, it's a series and it's, it's, this is what it's about during the war. Like they, you know, the one design house that was still open that Christian Dior and other big designers worked out, but they weren't big yet then, mm -hmm. but they were just trying to, you know, survive during the war. And then it was this whole story where Christian Dior's sister was in a concentration camp and he's trying to find her and all this. But at the end, when the war's over, the, they decide they're going to make these um, miniature design collections because they, nobody's going to be buying fancy clothes because they're all poor and depressed but you know they're doing it more as an art exhibit you know just yeah. to raise the spirits of everybody so they designed these little miniatures and they had these people that somebody made the little sculptures out of wire and they made little teeny like real like everything's real like little shoes little everything's done just like it would be big size but it's like tiny mm -hmm. and so anyway the Mary Hill Museum has them all has not all of them but most of them on display they rotate the display like they, they'll have you know for like five months, I think it was, and then they'll have a different ones, but yeah, it was cool. So I always it's wanted so to go cool. there, but I just, I drive that way a lot to go see my parents and I'm always, it's such a long drive. I'm in a hurry and I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. really like stopping. I'll do it another time. So I just yeah. never did years and years, never went. And so this was great. She organized that we all went, we had lunch, they gave a talk about it. And then we got to go around and look at all the clothes. It was really cool. Yeah. Was, thanks for telling me that. Cause I'm like, what a little hidden treasure that yes. I didn't yeah. even know it was around here. That's so cool. So what do you see in the future for So House 7, even like the next like two years? We'll keep it low key, two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, two years are probably just going to be a lot of the same, just because mm -hmm. I've got a lot of family things going on. So it's hard to like, I feel like I've kind of stepped away from the business a little bit, even though I'm working. I just have a lot of family obligations, but I have all these patterns that are like so close to being ready. And I'm just hoping to like gradually get them out. And then it's after, like the sewing works in progress, yes. it's like yes. same, same thing, like almost there. You just got to set the buttons yeah. on, whatever, get the buttonholes in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that doesn't sound very exciting. I know, but it is my 10 year anniversary in August. So I'm trying to think of something big. You know, mm -hmm. there'll be a sale, I'm sure, but hopefully something else, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And then I don't know. I've, I've toyed around with, as I get older and maybe want to work less, like doing more retreat kind of things, which, uh, you know, I, I mean, I have so much, that. 100%. I've had so much fun with my friends that I met, you know, locally that sewing, you know, a couple of times we've gone to the beach and sewed, and it was just so much fun. And I thought, you know, if other people could enjoy that. And I went to a sewing retreat on a Caribbean island. <laughs> it was so fun. I mean, we hiked, we did yoga, we snorkeled, but we also just sewed. And we also learned, like, we picked uh, indigo plants and learned how to make them into dye and then dye with them. And then we learned how to make sable lace and, you know, all sorts of things like that. And it was just so fun. And we ate really good local food. And so I, I thought something like that, I'm not the best at, like, planning super big events but if I paired up with somebody I think it could be fun you know yeah, but really cool. or a sewing cruise yeah yeah something like that yeah 
<laughs> yeah. Like I'd, I'd go to Alaska and so yeah. and get inspired by the views. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you know, it was so fun is like, it's, we all stayed up so late. We just stay up late and just sew and yeah. talk and it's just so fun and eat. And, you know, like I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not good at teaching. I don't love to just stand up there and teach and have to be organized and, oh, I forgot that. And oh, what about mm-hmm. this? But if I'm just helping people or just talking and we're making things and yeah, that I love, you know? Yeah. So I thought about that. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, well, I'm I'll not, keep my eye out. Whatever yeah. drops, I'll be there. Yeah. I'm not promising that. it's oh, happening, yeah. but that's what I've been thinking. <laughs> <laughs> what how do you stay motivated like like you just said you have things going with your family you're kind of having to take a, sta- a, a step back but we always have to if we're going to own a business we do have to kind of think forward so yeah. how do you keep yourself motivated or especially like creatively motivated that is a tough one I think okay now, now I'm going to sound like a downer I think the hard part about my business is luckily it's my baby and I love it so I I, I persevere but it's not always as creative as you'd think either because Mm -hmm. I sell paper patterns. And so I find a lot of my time is becoming a stock manager, just a stock manager shipping. I do have somebody that ships for me now, but you know, I still have to order the stuff. She's worked part-time ordering things, making sure we have enough of things. And, and no, it's just, there's not a lot of time to, I have so many ideas and not enough manpower and time to, to get them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but like, I don't, I don't do new year's resolutions, but there's something about like right around the new year. I don't know why, but I get totally inspired. Like I just get excited. Like this year I'm going to do this, and get all these ideas. And I kind of start on all of them. And then as the year goes on, it's like, Oh, I got one or two done. <laughs> any of those done, I just did an old one or, you know, like, <laughs> so you're human. Know. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I don't know. I mean, I get motivated at the beginning of the year and then the summer, I usually kind of have to take a little time because I'm like, that's, we're outdoorsy. And Mm -hmm. my son, actually, this is going to be the last year that my son is here staying with us. He's going to be a senior in high school. So I'm just trying to spend a little more time, you know, with them because I know that time is precious. And, you know, in the past, I get so overwhelmed with my business that it's like, I put them aside and, and focus on that. And now I've just kind of, you know, I've got to, I got to take a little bit of a step back during the summer and, yeah. and focus on family. And so then usually when I take that little step back, when, when the weather starts turning, I get a little bit more excited and mm-hmm. motivated. And now I've been doing that long enough. I just kind of know the ebb and flow of my motivation and inspiration mm-hmm. and, and, and deal with it, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, I'm closing up shop or <laughs> right, right, right. You're just, and it's kind of similar with, uh, with bridal sewing. Like we have our peak seasons. I have my low seasons. I have times where it's like, I just want to stay home and like not be social. I need to catch up with my energy. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not a loser. I'm just, now I know how my body works. Yeah. <laughs> like Now I know what it feels like to be tired and what I need to do to like rest up. And it might yeah. not just be sleeping. It might literally just be like, I just want to read in the backyard for a while. Like that's what I need to (laughs) to get back into this, you know? Yeah. Okay. So let's pretend that you were not into the sewing creative industry and you kind of, you may have given this away earlier in our conversation. What would you have done or what would you be if you weren't a pattern designer, like in an alternative universe or something? Well, if I could decide now and then decide back when I was (laughs) going to call it. (laughs) We have lots of options. It sounds like. (laughs) I mean, this sounds kind of gross, but I am really interested in gut health. And I think I would, even if I was stuck in a lab, I would just love to like come, come up with all the different experiments and, you know, that I can do, you know, with gut, I don't know, I'm some kind of, not a doctor, but like maybe have my PhD, you know, but do more research, Mm -hmm. gut health research, Mm -hmm. I think. And probably, we know when you were like studying to be a dietitian, like you could have done that now as a dad, yeah. but like back then that just like, wasn't a thing, but now it's like, there are so many dietary specialists that, you know, hone in right. on like, okay, the power of kombucha, like that could be your, right. little, you know, right. But I think even just like conducting the experiments and looking at the bacteria, yeah. and all like the real meat of it. Yeah. That I would totally be into now. And I never would have thought I would, you know, way back, you know, when I'm just starting college, that wouldn't have interested me, but now I didn't even know that was a thing. So learning things every day. 
<laughs> well, there's still time. So you can yeah. do that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. So tell listeners, because if you're listening, you're a bridal seamstress, you know, we, we sew for work and we say, Oh, I wanted to ask you, you said you had a little bit of a uh, experience with friends who are brides who asked you. To yeah. Do- yeah. I have a go south. Have funny bridal stories. Um, <laughs> so one, well, I've made a few wedding dresses for friends, you know, it's been a while, but yes, I've made a few wedding dresses, but I've also made bridesmaids dresses. Oh, and fantastic. one of them was kind of a funny situation. Cause I, I used to be really good friends with this guy in college and he, his, his wife, they're no longer, no longer together, but she was a little odd. <laughs> she had me in the wedding. She was so funny. She had never sewed before. And she decided she was going to make her wedding dress because I think she, cause I sewed, she kind of wanted to yep. show me she could do it. And she Little made best dress. friends, wedding vibes happening. Yeah. yeah. She <laughs> didn't finish it until like she was supposed to be on the altar. And his mom was like, come on, we have to go. And she's like cussing and just hemming it with the raw edges and just, you know, like, oh. <laughs> but also so she'd asked me if I would make the bridesmaids dresses and there were four of them and um they were like red satin this is the 90s classic candy apple red yeah yeah. (laughs) cheap satin and one of the two of the bridesmaids they all lived elsewhere like I never got to actually fit them but they all were kind of the same height as me and the same measurements and so I thought well I'll just make my dress and make two more you know this is great you know and (laughs) So I did, but one of them was going to lose weight and she didn't tell me this. So she gave me smaller measurements, assuming she would be that weight when we got there. So she gets off the plane. We have no time to fit, you know, or change anything and we can't get it zipped up, mm. you know? So we had that, we had to pin it. And, <laughs> and then to top it off when the wedding started, well, long story short, I ended up fainting in the wedding. <laughs> Like my legs spread eagle with this red satin dress, you know, like <laughs> and the bride laughing at me. <laughs> oh that was like a trauma. It was probably a trauma, like watching the bride like finishing her dress, like <laughs> walking down the aisle is probably what like set you off. <laughs> I know she was sewing it and she's just F bomb, F bomb, F bomb. And and his mom was like, Oh dear, honey, oh dear, we need to go, you know. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what a picture. Ooh, yeah, and then you're like, I'm done. No more weddings for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. gosh, well, that was like a little peek into our lives. No, yes. I'm kidding. We do like to get the dresses done like about a week before the wedding. So hopefully nothing's being done like right before the <laughs> head down the aisle. But listeners who are like professional sewists, we need to be reminded like, okay, the ebbs and flows are normal and creativity isn't always like at our fingertips. It's normal to like need rest or feel overwhelmed or like need to, you know, have the business take a back seat for a couple months or whatever. And it doesn't mean that like you're done forever. It doesn't mean the creativity is dead. It's just like, this is what it takes, you know? And like you said, sometimes you just have to stock stuff, be your stock manager. And there are definitely things that we have to do in our side of the business where it's like, this is not luxurious. This is not creative, but somebody's got to do it. (laughs) For a reason. (laughs) Exactly. So where can our listeners find you? Because I love, I love to have a fun project like, and I'm trying to be more intentional to have a fun project on the side so I can like come home and just make something for me. You know, it doesn't have to be, even if it's like quarterly or like every couple of months, just even if it's like, like I said, a tunic or something easy that isn't bridal, I can put in a fun audiobook and just, you know, let the machine do its thing. So I encourage listeners to do the same, like pick up something fun. So where can they find you? Where can they follow you? Tell us all the things. They can find me at www.sohouse7.com and that's spelled S-E-W-H-O-U-S-E with the number seven.com. And same with Instagram, so house seven with the number seven. Mm-hmm. I also have Facebook, but I, I hate to say I never check it. It's just I know. I know. the Instagram stuff goes there, but the questions will direct you 
to me, like at my website, you know, my email. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, okay, I we'll be following along and we'll be, you know, just, just checking back to see if there's any events listed because <laughs> that would be so much fun. Yeah. And I do have, so last fall I went to New York and I got some really fun fabric for a frock and I'm like, okay, this would be my frock tails fabric. So now I need to make it, I need to do the thing and go because I'm looking at it. It's this really cute pink floral and it's like, where else would I wear that? I don't know. But if I made it, I'd wear it to frock tails and then I would find another excuse to wear it to like Safeway or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the market, who knows? <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm really excited to get this conversation out to our listeners. So I know you're really busy. So thank you so much for making time for us. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and share this podcast with a friend. And if you're feeling really generous, leave a review. Thanks, everyone.